Hey, welcome back for another episode of Control Your Brain with me, Dr. Trish Lee. Buckle up because in this episode, we are going to talk about video game addiction. We are going to talk about five important things. Number one, video game addiction. Is it a real thing? And if so, what is it? Number two, we want to talk about what are the signs and symptoms of a video game addiction? Number three, we're going to talk about what is the mindset or the thought processes for someone with a video game problem. This is important and I'm going to base it on some research studies. Then number four, how do you diagnose or what is the cause of a video game addiction? And of course, number five is your brain hack strategy for today. What do you do if you yourself or someone you love is addicted to video games? So let's dive in because that's a tall order for a short podcast, if you know what I mean. Okay, so video game addiction, is it real? What is it? Essentially, yes. In fact, video game addiction is real. We know that internet gaming disorder is recognized not only through the World Health Organization International Classification of Diseases, but also in the United States by the DSM-5, which is the manual that mental health professionals use to be able to say, does something qualify as a problem or not? So we know internet gaming disorder or problem, problematic internet gaming is recognized now as a true verifiable issue. But beyond that, anecdotally, we know that so many kids, tweens and teenagers and young adults and even grown adults struggle with video games and that pull back into the screen for video gaming. I'm going to explain that pull to you throughout this podcast, but I want you to know it's recognized and it's real. So it falls under the classification of a behavioral disorder. So it's kind of like into a gambling disorder. And if you know me and if you know my work, you also know that I have another podcast and another full YouTube channel for pornography addiction. It is very similar to internet addiction in terms of explicit content. It's just one or two rungs lower on the chain in terms of what it does to the brain. So if you follow my work over there, then this work work is an extension of that work. And this is equally as important because a video game problem can kind of be a feeder into other internet problems. But what I want you to know is it's recognized as a behavioral disorder. And what that means is that when a person plays video games, and this is probably segueing to the cause also, but when you play a lot of video games, what happens is your brain becomes linked into that cyber world and it it feels good being in that world because it's set up in a way that it gives your brain a lot of rewards and it also manages stress and maybe boredom of the real world. So it really truly has a pull back into the screen. And that's why it's likened to a gambling disorder because it really is about the reward and that feeling of reward transcending the feeling of loss. And so it falls underneath that category. But here's what I want you to know. It's real and it's affecting millions of young men and now moving into middle-aged men across the world. Yes, it's affecting primarily men, but every single day, more young women are becoming gamers. Now, I have to tell you, this comes with no judgment. If you know me again, all this stuff comes with no judgment. I'm the proud mama of five and a half gamers. I have five and a half children. My Beautiful bonus son is going to be almost 32, believe it or not, which is crazy. And then all my children and my husband are gamers. Now, we wouldn't call me a gamer and the kids keep saying that I should become a gamer because I'd probably be good. But I will tell you, I have crushed that family in Tekken more times than they would like me to admit publicly. So uh, I'm saying I'm pretty good at games. I just don't spend any time doing it. But it comes with no judgment and you can use games in a healthy way to have some fun. And especially the games of today have really become extravagant and have like the game that my husband plays. Currently, he's playing 
Boulder's Gate, I think it's called. And it is, you know, it's puzzles, it's challenges. It really activates his mind and helps him think in a really healthy way. And, you know, it's not like he's playing a hundred hours of it. He's playing it on and off. And it's a way for him to kind of chill out after a long day. But, you know, if he was playing it three, four, five hours a day, that might become problematic. And we are going to discuss that. But this conversation here is about there is a place for healthy gaming, but then it's also a slippery slope for many people because of the mechanisms caught up in it. And they are programmed very specifically to be able to give the brain a lot of reward. So we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, but it's affecting mostly men and more young women every single day. So video game addiction, in fact, is very real and it's impacting millions and millions of people across the world. And it is a slippery slope of a negative feedback loop. If you continue to play too much and allow yourself to play too much and you don't regulate it, it can really keep pulling you in at the detriment of your real life. And I'm going to talk about why and the cause, but let's move number two to the symptoms of a video game addiction. So we know that there's healthy way to game, but if you move over on that continuum into an unhealthy gaming pattern or internet addiction or video game addiction, what some of the signs and symptoms might be are poor, poor performance at school or kind of poor performance at work, letting your household responsibilities go and spending a lot of time and energy on gaming. And the way that I've talked about this with my family, because I can smell it on them when it's happening, it's you can see they're getting through their life to get back to their game. And there has been times where my precious husband's been like that. And I'm like, dude, what is going on? You're like barely with me here in the world. I can feel you're just getting through life to get back to your game. That's what it feels like for the person. That's what it looks like from the outside. So if you see performance in school go down, performance in work go down, kind of less engagement in life, this could be a very big sign. Here's a huge sign. Number two is withdrawal symptoms when they're not playing video games. So if you have a kiddo and you do what I do when I see, I have one particular child and I do not want to call said child out. It's one of my boys. So I already told you I have three boys and three girls. It's one of my boys. He has the potential for video game addiction. He's the only one who he would play video games all day, every day. If I didn't teach him to regulate it. And if I didn't step in the times where I see he's becoming dysregulated, which is exhausting by the way. So what happens is if he's gaming too much and he's not able to cut himself off, I take his cord away, the literal cord for his computer. I know what you're thinking. You probably think that's mean. It's not mean it's co-regulation. I'm helping this man to regulate himself. So the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the first five, six days where we take the cord away, he is miserable. So the symptoms are sadness, anxiety, irritability, literally doesn't know what to do with his time at all. Those are withdrawal symptoms. But by day five, it usually it clears up and he becomes a different kid. And we usually take the cord for two weeks and he has to sh demonstrate regulation of himself within those two weeks. So it's not a guaranteed two weeks. It's let's see your brain come back online. Let's see you re-engage in your life. And then you earn your cord back, which usually takes two weeks. So it's a two week minimum, but sometimes it is longer. And honestly, we've only done this a handful of times over his lifetime and he's 16. So you know, it's just when you can see it getting away. And sometimes it's the particular game. Sometimes it's just the amount of time played equals the downward spiral of the more time that they want to play. So withdrawal symptoms are real. Anxiety, irritability, anger, um, not knowing what to do with oneself when they're not allowed to play the game. Okay, so moving on, that was number two. To number three, a need to spend more and more time playing video games to get the same level of enjoyment. So we know when it comes to internet addictions of all sorts that exist on a continuum, there is tolerance building and escalation. So the tolerance building means 
you spend X amount of time and then that makes you feel good. But after a while, your brain calibrates to that and you need to spend more time. At the same time, it could be intensity or it could be the game that you're playing and what you're playing. So what happens is there's tolerance building and escalation more and more time and you need to ramp up. And this could be, you know, the types of games need to get more intense. Okay, the next one is giving up previously enjoyed activities or social relationships due to gaming. And this is the thing that I can sniff out. If you're not engaged in your life, then you're not allowed to play video games. And we have a rule that I'm gonna share with you in our brain hack for the day so that it's very tangible and it's very concrete on how to manage video games so that you stay in a neurologically regulated state. Okay, so that's the giving up of activities, preferring to be in a video game than to do things in the world. Being able, unable to reduce playing time and have unaccess, unacceptable attempts to quit gaming despite the negative consequences. So what this means is a person tries to reduce the amount of time they play. They try to stop, but they just can't. It is a pull. And I'm going to tell you why in the cause. But the pull is so strong that they cannot reduce or bring themselves out of the screen entirely. And that's what it, the essence of a compulsion or an addiction involves. It means you are dependent upon the behavior to feel good. You need that pleasure to offset your stress and boredom. And then ultimately you don't learn, you know, in terms of children and adolescents, they don't learn how to regulate themselves in the world to just sit around and feel good without high levels of stimulation. So this is another sign and symptom. Lying to family members or others about the amount of time spent video gaming. And again, I can see this one coming a mile away when I ask said kiddo to get off of his games, but he doesn't. And a rumor had it, he pulled a couple all-nighters this summer. Yep, yanked that cord away when I got wind of the all-nighter. And I'm actually thinking about putting one of those blink cameras in the upstairs hallway because my bedroom is not on the same level as theirs. So he'll be gaming and the other kids will hear, but I don't hear. And then I don't, I can't pull the plug. And he's told me that he's gone to bed. Excuse me while I get a little water here, but that's fake news and that's what the lying is. So it's not lying for the sake of lying. It's because they can't stop playing and they know it's unacceptable to their family or to their loved one, but they can't stop. So then lies become the defense mechanism because the need and the dependency for gaming is there. So that's why my heart feels for people in this position. And it really is a neurological dysregulation issue. The chains have to be broken at the brain level, and I'm going to explain it to you in a minute. A decline in personal hygiene or grooming. So all other things start to take the back burner, and excessive time in video games makes it so that things in the real world don't matter as much anymore. That's why household responsibilities go down. So does hygiene. So if you see hygiene slipping, it's another warning sign. It's a red flag. Um, using video games to escape stressful situations at work or school or to avoid conflicts at home. So we know when it comes to internet addiction, many times it's a self-soothing behavior. So in the screen, their brain feels really good because of, and I'm going to tell you this in the cause, it's a dopamine dependency. So all the dopamine gets flowing in the brain and it basically makes the person no longer think about the stressors in real life. So the more stressors in real life, the more the game will pull the person in. Watch for that self-soothing. And the next sign is using video games to relieve negative moods, to offset hopelessness, to you know get rid of that negativity or that negative thinking. Self-soothing for stress, for negative thoughts, and for boredom. Okay, so these are the signs and symptoms. And to put a bow on that, basically, the pull into the screen to feel pleasure begins to be the only thing that's important to that person's brain. And that's why it's an addiction or a compulsion. Okay, so what causes video game addiction? This is the third thing that we're gonna talk about today. The cause I already kind of gave you the peek at is a dopamine dependency. So we know when 
you go back to the internet and the same for social media and certain people, same for email or for work and other people. But in this video, we're going to talk about in this podcast episode, we're going to talk about video games. So what happens is the dopamine mechanisms and the reward center in the brain is basically uh, sensitized to video games. So the person's brain feels the best when playing video games. Unfortunately, what that does is it creates a dopamine deficit in their real life. So it becomes a catch 22 because in the video game is how the person's brain feels the best, but it makes it so that in the real world and in their life, that's when their brain feels the worst and they don't know it. They don't see it. That's why there's withdrawal symptoms in those first five days for my precious child. And that's why when I see that life's no longer doing it for him, then I have to pull the plug because I have to teach him how to regulate himself so he doesn't become an adult who does nothing but game. And I know this is so much trickier in today's day and age because he meets all of his friends in the game. So thankfully for him, he's not just playing that game by himself. And I'm going to tell you the family rule when we get to it in the brain hack, but it is pretty funny because they'll all go to the Friday night like football game, him and his friends. Then they'll go to the Mexican place and get food. And then they'll be, they'll all be here. And then they'll be like, okay, bye dude. See you later. And the other night, my husband said, is that code for see you in 15 minutes? And it is, they all go back to their respective homes and they meet online a half hour later, but that becomes the family rule. They have to go meet in the world if they want to meet online. So if I see him no longer wanting to go out, but he just wants to stay in the screen, that's when the balance is off. But it does become trickier because it's so social for many kids. So I do understand that social aspect and I will kind of, I'll nuance the family rules when there's a lot of socialization in there. But if it's gaming by oneself, I hold tight to the rules we're about to discuss. But basically it's a dopamine dependency. There's a dopamine flood in the, in the screen. There's a dopamine deficit in their life. And that imbalance becomes more and more and more the more they gain. And it perpetuates the negative feedback loop. And you've probably heard me say this before. It's called Hebb's Law. Neurons that fire together, wire together. So if they're wiring together towards video games, that is the direction they're going to keep going towards. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter of motivation, more, and pleasure. And in this case, it's motivation for more video games to feel the most pleasure possible. Unfortunately, it leads to duds in the real life. The real life in the world doesn't do it anymore. It could never compare to how good they feel when they're in the screen. And I do want to transition. I skipped, uh, I believe I skipped, and we're going to go to it right now. The cognitive processes behind people who end up with a video game addiction. And this is from a study from Daniel King and Paul DeFabro. And it is the cognitive psychology on internet gaming. And I want to read to you, share with you the four psychological processes or thought processes behind people who have an internet gaming problem. And it's interesting. And the reason I wanted to do this is because it is a review of 36 studies on internet gaming and the commonalities behind the thought processes for people who get wrapped up in internet addiction. And I know I see these pieces in the kids and the adolescents that I work with that have internet gaming disorder. So the idea is that the, the factors included their beliefs about the game reward value and tangibility. So in the screen, there's this identity with their avatar and that avatar empowers them. And the reward to be that avatar and the way the games are set up makes it so that that is a skewed perspective. And I know I've had this experience with um, my child, whose name I almost divulged yet again. When he was young, he bought all those skins. I'm sure some of you have kids who've bought those skins. Very expensive. You know, took the old credit card. I know so many people took the old credit card, put it in so he could buy outfits for his avatar because he was relating to the reward of having an awesome outfit and to having some, some good weapons or whatever it is. That's that belief about the game's reward value. 
it's become skewed, a distorted reality of how awesome the game is. That's the first one. B is maladaptive and inflexible rules about gaming behavior. So kind of having like a code of going back into the screen and not being able to be cognitively flexible anymore about using games or how to approach in the perspective on gaming. The third one, C, is over-reliance on gaming to meet self-esteem needs. And I want to linger here for a minute. I almost said it back in A, but like when the child or even the adult, when the person who's in the game is relating so strongly to the avatar, it can make someone who feels weak in the world feel strong in the game. And it can be someone who's shy in the world. And now in the game, if they're playing with strangers, they can be uh, rough or they can be boisterous or they can be loud where at their school, they might be quiet and sheepish. So it can really enhance self-esteem, but it's in a very distorted way. And that the game leads to that and the way that it's set up. So if there's an over-reliance to meet self-esteem needs, that can be a problem. We want kids, we want adults, we want healthy people to build self-esteem out in their life, not in a game. And you know, the Ready Player One is a, a movie that they made about this and uh, to a certain extent it's about this, it was a book. And it's pretty cool because it shows like how much people start identifying with those avatars. And the last one is D, is gaming as a method of gaining social acceptance. I think these two last ones, especially are really, um, you know, wrapped up in the cognitive processes that really make it so there's a push back into the screen also. The pull is there from the rewards, from the visual aspects, from the feedback, but then that push is there for self-esteem and social acceptance and kind of being able to be the avatar that they've not figured out to be in their life. What I want is for people to figure out how to be the best version of themselves in their life regulate their brain and their behavior in a healthy way and not have to go back into the screen for those things. Okay, so I I said that out of order, but uh, we covered the cause and we covered the cognitive processes. So let's talk about how this would be diagnosed. So the cause is a dopamine dependency. You can go to a mental health professional, professional uh, who will do a test. Sorry, I'm choking today got marbles in the mouth, probably because I'm hyped up about this one, but you can go to a mental health professional who will use a qualitative test to ask questions about the amount of time spent, about how it impacts a person. But I'm here to tell you a service that I offer is called QEEG Brain Mapping. And now with the advances in technology, I'm able to do brain maps across the entire world. I do at-home brain mapping. And it's as easy as you purchase some affordable hardware, you download some software, and you can only do it through my service, but then we spend an hour together after you take your map at home, and I'm able to break down if I can see that dopamine dependency in your brain, and I can see how the gaming has impacted that neurological regulation. And that's what I'm always talking about here on this podcast. So just to give you the one over is that when your brain is in a regulated state, you're in that calm focus state and you're using medium brain speed. But when you go into the game, it creates this wired and tired effect over time. It creates neurological dysregulation. So it feels good in the moment, but it's creating these problems as it feels good. So I can see that in a person's brain performance pattern. So if you go over to drtrishlee.com, and you look at the QEEG brain map page under work with Dr. Trish Lee, you'll see an example there of internet gaming brain. And basically it looks like a brain that's on fire in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobes because the reward center and the executive function skills and judgment and all that in the frontal lobe has been impacted. So long story short, you can now see how internet gaming impacts your brain in a QEG brain map. And if that feels like something you're interested in, I would love to be able to help you see it because once you see it with your own eyes, then you want to be able to manage video games and to take care of 
and to reduce and alleviate and back yourself out of an internet gaming addiction if that's where you are. So how do we do that? The primary way that I do that is I use something called neurofeedback coaching. So after we have that QEG brain map, then I can use technology, state of the art, 2024 technology. I know we're moving into it, but 2024 technology, the highest state of the art technology that you can use at home. And what you're able to do is it's like a workout for your brain. Every day you gently guide your brain out of the internet gaming mode back into the optimal mode. And if you found video games when you were young, your brain may never have developed into the optimal mode. So we might get you there for the first time ever. So you can see that everything I do is measurable. So we see what your brain's doing in your brain map. We see your brain change over time. People who work with me basically get the results they're looking for and it's always measurable. So if you're interested in that, check out the pages on neurofeedback coaching on my website. It is a number one modality to be able to regulate your brain. Now, what else can you do uh, on top of that? I also offer a digital program called Brain Training 101 that teaches you how to train your brain back to that optimal mode. Let me tell you what some of those techniques are. There's cognitive behavioral techniques, thinking and acting in a new way. There's mindfulness techniques on top of these neurological regulation techniques. But I'm going to give you your one brain hack strategy now so that you have a real takeaway to go help your loved one who is being sucked into gaming. Are you ready for it? It is for every hour spent in the game, you have to spend double in your life. And honestly, it should be triple. So that's the rule that we have here. You want a game this evening? You, you better spend the day actually enjoying your life. And it should be three hours on in the world, one and a half hours on gaming. And it doesn't always work out perfectly, but my son, who I've been teaching this to for a long time, he's gotten himself to the point where I can hear him gaming with his friends on a Saturday, and then I can hear him playing basketball. And then he goes out for lunch, and then I hear basketball again, and then I hear gaming again. So it's a really easy rule to be able to regulate yourself. That way, you're not on your game all day long. So if you get up on a Saturday and you want to play your game, you play for an hour and a half, and then you go do three things in the world, three hours of things in the world. You make breakfast, you clean your room, you do your laundry, you go for a walk or a jog, then you can play a little bit more. You meet your friends online and then you have some fun. But then an hour and a half later, it's like, okay, friends, I'll see you later on. Then you train your dog. Then you go crank some weights, then you do a puzzle, then you build a Lego, then you have dinner with your fam squad, then you go back on. Balancing the gaming with real life. And I know it sounds so easy, but if you're not doing it and you stay in the screen too long, you're wiring, your, wiring and tiring your brain and neurons that fire together, wire together. You are wiring in a brain that will constantly want to go back for more. Okay, so this is the real deal. Video game addiction is real. It's impacting so many children, young men, uh, older men. It's impacting young women these days, not really so much middle-aged or older women, but young women for sure. So if you're struggling with video games, please reach out to me. I offer consultations or definitely just get in for QEG brain map so I can show you what your brain is doing to inspire and empower you to make the changes that you need to so you can rock out your best life in the real world at your full potential. Let's develop that brain so you can be at your full potential for the rest of your life and manage your video games. All right, until next time, control your brain or it'll control you.